Okay, hello everybody. We are here tonight with our very first Zoom meeting. And tonight we have Jen Carroll, who is a certified life coach, who is going to be talking to us about energy levels and specifically energy levels as we progress through our assault journey. Um, kind of our mindset from victim transitioning over to survivor. And I know that she has a lot to share, so I'm gonna turn it over to Jen. Thank you, Chris. Yes, thank you, Chris Pedretti. Um, I, I appreciate being, oh my God, your first guinea pig. I mean, um, volunteer to help with these presentations and to bring wisdom and brilliance to the group. I love your group. Thank you for allowing me to be part of it. And what I have for us today is something called energy levels. And the reason that they're important and the reason we learn about them in life coaching, and they're definitely a tool we use in coaching, is that they, these energy levels are things that we all move through all day long, and I'm going to explain how that works. But also this concept, I'm going to basically keep it really simple and take you through the essential essence of the energy levels so that I hope you're going to get an aha moment of how you can use these things to help you do better and to help you have a um, increase your life satisfaction. And life satisfaction is the, is the metric. It's not really a metric, but it is the metric we use in coaching to evaluate how somebody's doing and feeling. And that's very different from happiness. So I don't want you to think that getting using a coach and working with a coach gets you to happiness. No, it gets you to life satisfaction, which is reflected by your ability to control your life, feel like you have agency and ability to influence it, feel like you're able to influence and control your own feelings. And so this idea of life satisfaction is really the end game, the goal you want. In, the, in life satisfaction, you'll have happiness, you'll have sadness, you'll have all those things because that's normal living. But the idea is that you're durable, you have this resilience, you can move through life. And the, and the more you feel like you have the ability to influence your own life and to have an impact on your own life, the greater your life satisfaction. So I'll give you some examples as we go through this, but we're going to talk broadly about energy and then the two big kinds of energy. And then I'm going to share the one tool that I think you should grab as a, a screen grab or make sure you can grab it. You can even grab it off the groups, um, the post that we put up to advertise this session. But it is the one thing that's nice to come back to when you're like, I forgot what's happening. This one, one graphic can help you remember. So I have that to share with you as well. And then if you have any questions, I'm in the group. I won't be on Facebook till after the election because I'm trying to just leave that alone right now. But I am absolutely reachable through the group or through Messenger. So you can find me very, very accessible. Okay, so I'm going to dive in. I have imagery that I'm going to share, but I know some folks might be listening audio only. So I'll try to explain the imagery a little bit if it's relevant to get you to help you understand the metaphors that I was using and why it's important. So here we go. Let's dive in. Hopefully, everybody's able to see my screen. Energy awareness. There's two, energy awareness is important. There's two things that we talk about a lot in coaching, but you'll see that this is something people talk about in all kinds of um, situations and contexts. And that's the idea of being conscious, your own consciousness, being conscious of what you're doing, and then the idea of intention. So I usually swap out the word conscious and consciousness with the word awareness because I think it's a little easier for people to, to grasp. It doesn't sound so woo-woo. And also the idea of awareness is something that you can tap all the time. In fact, it's a really good thing to get used to just being aware of what's going on because sometimes you can be having an anxiety attack. Sometimes you can be really blue and you can't stop crying. Being, taking a moment and being aware of how you're doing and what is going on right now with yourself can half, it can cut the, the reaction or what you're experiencing in half. So first, I want you to think about consciousness. And as we talk about this energy, it's going to give you a way to look at your consciousness. And then I want you to think about intention. And we'll talk about intention in the second half here. But intention is really being, making a conscious decision about what you want to do. So it could be everything from being at a traffic light where you're going to kill the person in front of you because they will not go when the light turned green and you're working yourself up. So if you said, I'm going to drive with intention today and my intention is 
I don't care when I get there, I'll get there. I just really want to get there in a good mood. Then if you're at that light and you're ready to kill the person in front of you, you then lean back on that intention and go, what am I doing? Why am I working myself up over this right now? This is such a waste of energy. And also it's making me feel bad, which is the number one thing those kind of things do is they make you feel bad. So you're the victim of your own consciousness. So this is the, these are big concepts, super simple concepts with a cute few key fundamentals. And one is being aware of what you're, how you're feeling and what you're doing and then setting an attention about what you want to do. So I'll go on to the next slide here, but this slide, I mean, this is a peaceful slide that just says essentially energy awareness increases consciousness and intention. It's a really nice tool to use. So when we dive in, um, one of the first things, and I have a slide up right now that shows a butterfly on a beautiful, looks like a bear daisy, look pink, and it's maybe a monarch, but I don't think so. Um, anyway, this little butterfly is here because it's the it, it's to remind us of the idea of the butterfly effect. And I know there's a movie out, I think, with Aston Kutcher. But the idea is, the, the, the chaos theory support for the butterfly effect is that what happens in one place can affect what happens in another. I have never seen the butterfly effect more viscerally communicated than in a family. Then when one person comes in in a crappy mood, and can take down a whole house. That right there, that's butterfly effect. Um, conceptually, if you're dealing with the chaos theory, it's much more abstract and much more complicated. But the idea here is that feelings are contagious. And so the better job you're doing of being aware, being self-aware is a better job you're gonna have of making sure that you don't have a negative impact on everybody else. And also the other way around, it provides you with a level of armor or protection to not let that negative person that walks into the room take you down. So if you see this happening, this is why consciousness is so good. If you, if you see this happening, now that you're paying attention to it, now that you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jen said butterfly effect. This is what's happening right now. Everybody got to work. Everybody's in a crappy mood. I don't want to, I don't want to be part of that. That's not how I started my day. This is not fun. You can use this as armor to say, I'm not going to participate in the negativity, or you could look at the person who came in negative. Let's say it's your daughter who just took a test and you don't know why she's angry, but boy, she came in the house hot. You can take a moment to respond to her feelings instead of trying to cajole her out of them. You can actually look at her and say, you seem so angry and frustrated. Just that acknowledgement often releases a lot of the negativity because she's been seen, she's been heard, and she had no idea that you noticed that she was miserable. In fact, with kids, half the time they're doing the things they do because they don't know how to say, I'm miserable, I need help. So think of this idea of, as that feelings are contagious and they have this butterfly effect because it's really important to know how your energy is affecting others. It, it'll provide you with some motivation to be more aware of how you are and what you're doing because you can take out a whole household if you're not careful. You can take out your whole workforce, whatever. You can really have a big impact if you're coming in hot or if, if you protect yourself from not adopting other people's feelings. Hey, Jen. Yes. Before you go on, you might be covering this later, but we do have a question. Yes, and the question is, uh, when, do you set your, when do you set intention? You could set it every five seconds if you would like. So how you choose to set the intention is really about what you need to be successful. And I could also say to cope. So you could, your intention could be super small and it's maybe something you do in the morning when you're brushing your teeth and you go, today, I am not going to take on more than I can handle. And my plan is that if it starts to become more than I can handle, I'm going to make an effort to go outside and put my feet on the grass. I'm just making that up. But it, I think with folks that have trauma, what's really important is constantly checking in and de-escalating intentions. Because I do think trauma victims constantly are trying to prove that they're good and that they're worthy and that they're working hard and that they're not freeloaders and that they're not taking advantage because the shame of trauma puts you in that place where you always feel bad. And it's wrong. It shouldn't happen like that. But it's it's the way that this kind of trauma works. So the intention just could be, I today will always have an escape route. 
for taking a moment for myself. And it could be that you go to the bathroom several times that day. I, however, your strategy needs to work for you. It could be that I'm going to spend my lunch break sitting in my car, listening to classical music, because that just chills me out. Or uh, Monty Python, because I'm weird. Like whatever that is that you need, an intention doesn't have to be just for coping. Intention can also be for goal setting or anything else. But I think the, the value of intention is that it's so tied to awareness. So if you think, um, oh my God, when I feel like this, I yell at the kids too much. Especially if you're a trauma victim, you're already feeling like you don't have the support and resources you need to be successful. So you could say today, no matter what happens, my intention is not to yell at the kids, no matter what. And I'm gonna give you some ways to deal with that if that's your intention. I have That's the flip side of this presentation. So I'm gonna give you a couple tools to try to help you move you out of that space because it's hard to break habits. And it's hard to think about how could I get this done without yelling at the kids, but it's possible. So I'll, I'll show those, share those tricks with you. And so that, I, I think that Chris just left. Here I am. You just left me. But that's the, uh, that's the intention. Um, managing your energy really will help you drive a sense of well -be well-being. And you'll start to see as you play this out in your mind and you play with these ideas of what I'm talking about, you can see how it will help you have a better sense of well-being. Because first of all, you're looking out for yourself up front. You're actually making a plan of self-protection. That's maybe the best way to think about it for a trauma survivor is that you need to protect yourself first. It's just like the old, if you're going to put a mask on in the airplane, you've got to put your mask on first, right? So you need to take care of yourself first. And again, I'm going to stress this because trauma victims are notorious for this. Do not take on more than you can handle. That's the daily check-in. Have I really scoped my day in a way that I can cope when my brain seizes up, when I get the blues, when I feel like that panic attack is coming, make sure you scope your days in a way that are doable because that is going to make a big difference. When I have a picture of the ocean now, and actually this beautiful, beautiful blue wave, I'm so lucky to live by the ocean. Um, and, and in this blue wave, usually that's called the green room inside. If you're lucky enough to get inside that wave, you're in the green room, which um, I'm not a surfer, so I haven't been in the green room. But um, it's cool. And the, the, the reason I have this wave and the reason we need to think about this idea of constantly churning and moving is that that's how energy levels work. So I'm you're going to perceive that certain energy levels are probably not good. We call them unproductive, not bad, but we just say they're unproductive. And some of the energy levels are going to look like they're super desirable. But the point is, and the important, important point of this is, is that you will move through all of them all the time. So don't think you're supposed to be at X energy level and, and you're really at another one and that that's bad. No judgment. That's no judgment. You can, you're judged every place else. You're not going to be judged in this energy work. This is not a place for judgment. That's even a fundamental of coaching is to let go of that voice in your head that's judging. And it's, we're usually our worst judges, right? So you need to let go of that because you don't want to judge where you are, but you want to use where you are to potentially move to a different energy level. So what the heck does that mean? Let me, let me start with the two basic giant, giant concepts. And this one is a really good image, but I'm going to explain this image to you because I think it'll help explain the concept. There's two, essentially two kinds of energy. Just think of two kinds of energy. One is productive and one is unproductive. We call unproductive energy catabolic, meaning it just doesn't do anything. To, it slows down how you're moving through the day. It slows you down, not very productive. It's not nourishing you. It's not helping you particularly, but there's a reason to have it. And when you find out what these levels are, you'll understand why it's important to have and that we all go there. But the reason I use this image and this image is at the bottom, bottom, bottom. In this case, it's the bottom of a waterfall. But the point is that you're at the bottom of the pit and around you are stone walls all around you. If you had to decide which direction to go from this point of view, from the bottom of the pit, you have no visibility. In fact, if you imagine at the bottom of the pit, you're looking up to the sky, the only things you can see, you can't even see if clouds are coming. You can only see what is absolutely present at this moment. So you don't know if you have the right clothes for the weather. You don't know if the weather's gonna change. You don't know if, <coughs> excuse me, 
if you're close to civilization, that wasn't a COVID sneeze, I promise. You don't know if you're close to civilization or if you're far, far away from civilization or if there's even a rescue squad out there. You're at the bottom of the pit. And the reason this is so important and the reason you need to think of catabolic energy as being at the bottom of the pit is if I'm bugging you to be aware of how you're doing and to set intention, you have basically no visibility to the, your choices. As you sit at the bottom of the pit in your lowest energy possible, your choices are extremely limited because you can't even see what's available to you. That's a metaphoric pit, but you, I think you can understand how you are down at the bottom. And in order to come up, that's a lot of work to come up. And it is. When you're at the lowest energy level, it is a lot of work to come up. But it's really important to understand that you're at a place where you really can't see what your choices are in any meaningful way. And that's one reason that is, if you are at a low energy level at catabolic energy, that you want to have a way to move out of that so you can see what your choices are. If you have anabolic energy, and in this case, I love this picture. These are four kids laying on a dock in a lake. And they don't have their bathing suits on. It looks like maybe it's fall, but you can tell they're, they're going to put leaves in the water and ship those leaves. And the idea of this image is so related to anabolic energy is because you move from this idea of being calm to really inspired. And the, the delight I get in looking at this picture is I have no idea what these kids are going to do next. But what I do know is their ideas are not limited. They are not in a pit. They have complete visibility. In fact, ideally, they don't even have rules or anything. They're able to absolutely make it up as they go along, which is, of course, an incredibly desirable place to be if you're trying to innovate, brainstorm, change yourself. You don't want to have any constraints. You don't want any um, limiting beliefs. And and I can do a whole workshop just on limiting beliefs, but let me just give you an example of what a limiting belief is because we all have them and they can really get in our way. And a classic limiting belief is if I don't lock all the doors, I won't be safe. Okay, well, that's limiting you because suddenly you now you're fear-based. So you could flip that around and make that, that and look at that belief and go, well, that's not necessarily true. Of course, I could be safe without locking the doors. I may not like it like that. I might still feel anxious. But the truth is, I think I could be safe without locking the doors. Another way you could be safe without locking the doors is to feel really confident in your skills and and handling a situation that got out of control. And it's a bad, I, I probably put a really sh crappy example for some of surviving trauma, but the idea is that those trauma installed beliefs limit your choices. And that's really the most important part of this whole thing. The thing, so if your mother always said, oh, my mom, my mom's classic, like she would, like she hates this hair, get your hair out of your face, right? How many times have we heard, get your hair out of your face? Well, there's a pandemic and I haven't paid for a haircut yet. I haven't even figured that out. But like, I hear that limiting belief, it's still in there. And I go, that is so not true. I can wear my hair however I want but I still have the limiting belief. So limiting beliefs are, in coaching, we work through them and we try to identify them and good coaches hear you talk and then are able to pull them out of you and figure out what's going on. Um, but you can absolutely do this with your friends or with yourself. The key is to listen to yourself and to really question if what you just said is true or something you've made up in your mind that's a rule you've made up, a limiting belief that's changing your behavior, altering your behavior in some way. So let's let's go and I'll explain a little bit more about how this works. So when you're in an anabolic state and then, and, and altogether there's seven levels of energy that we talk about. Oh, I think that's the next slide. Talk about seven levels of energy, but when you're in, when you're at the highest levels of this energy, when your energy is just flowing and you're in the zone and there's no limiting beliefs and your and your awareness is high and your intention is set the possibilities are endless and I'm, i'll give you some examples of what i mean with these tools that i'm going to show you but the idea is that we usually get stuck because of all the other chatter i'm talking about uh, limiting beliefs not being aware of how you're really feeling not setting an intention so you just kind of let life happen to you instead of you really driving your life and take, making choices about your life. These are the things that can start to limit your possibilities. So that's why I think this energy work is so interesting to me because the minute I learned it, I'm like, this just makes sense. It just makes sense. So here, let's take a look. There's seven levels of energy. 
again, I'm going to remind you, you're going to go in and out and up and down through these all the day long. You, you just, different things will happen. Different situations will make, allow you to have a higher level of energy just because of the nature of the situation. And other things could be try, quite triggering and really drive you down. So let me talk to you about the two catabolic levels and why they're so critical for trauma survivors. The first has to do at the level one, it's red here. And this is the, this is the image. This graphic is the one that I say, hang on to, put it somewhere, tape it inside your bathroom door, something or someplace where you have privacy, where you can see it just so you can take a look at it. It's like your medicine cabinet, whatever, um, even in the shower, wherever you would like to put it. But the idea is by reminding yourself of where you are and where you can be, you can move yourself around in these energy levels on demand. So level one is that, is I, I call it the victim level. Life happens to me. I don't get to control it. It's all happening to me. And I feel very out of control. In fact, you see the words here on, it says feeling lost or stuck, lack of choice. I can't, or I have to. And it's generally driven by fear. So you, everybody has those things where like, I got to do this thing today and I don't want to do it. Oh, that's level one. Now, your trick is you've got to pop out of level one if you have to do the thing and you need to do well on it. You're going to have to pop out of level one, but it's okay to take a minute and feel really crappy in your level one. Like you can embrace your level one for that moment and go, oh, I didn't want to do this. This isn't my choice. My partner, my husband, my whatever signed me up for this. <sighs> I got to deal with it. Okay, it's fine to have those feelings, but then you have to move out of it. You can't stay there. So just be aware of level one, very victimy, very, it all happens to me. This is almost before even, the, the only limiting beliefs that support this are the ones that just confirm that things happen to you and you don't have any control. Those limiting, those would be limiting beliefs because you always have a choice to make some control. Even when you don't feel like you have control, there are still things you can do to feel like you have that control. And you can at least set some intentions and be aware of yourself during those times. So I'm going to tell you now the, the interesting thing that happens as you move from level one to level two. So level two can be pretty ugly. It's the fighting level. It's the one where you're going to be angry and be combative and resist your fight. But here's what I love about level two for trauma victims. In my experience, trauma victims start at level one and they can get pretty comfortable there. Once you give up all control and feel like the world's just here to screw you, you can kind of find a little place in there that doesn't require you to do the work. And that's the most important thing. I, th that's why Chris started the group is that you got to do the work. I'm so sorry, but you do. And, and as I've watched everybody change, it starts with telling your story. That's the first step. And then this amazing things happens is you move out of this victim -y state and you move into level two. And I often call this the burning down the house level because typically what happens is somebody who's felt like they haven't had control now starts to rage. And I personally think it's really healthy because you have to get your fight back if you're gonna fight. And I want you to keep fighting your way up, but I need to know you're in the game. And at level one, you are not in the game. At level one, you've, you're hiding. You've decided it's a safe place to hide and you just want to be there because everything else is hard. It is. And you're capable of moving past it. You are. I'm going to just tell you, you are. Because I've watched people do a lot of hard things, especially trauma survivors. And once they get this, their feet out of level one and start to get to level two, things start to change. Now, you need to be aware of how you're feeling and you need to be aware of the intention you're setting because you can blow up your world pretty fast at level two. And I want you to think about, we're going to move you from level two into level three. That's going to be the next step. But I also want you, I, I like looking at level two. Um, I think of it often when I think of kids because sometimes they'll just, especially if your kids don't feel very, like they have a lot of agency, they don't feel a lot of power. Once they get to level two, you can start to relax a little bit. Even if your house is yelling, everybody's yelling and everything, I think of it as a good sign because it means oh, my kid is fighting for themselves. Just like your inner soul would feel if you start fighting for yourself. The idea of moving to two means the fight is back and you're willing to fight 
for yourself. I'm not going to say you're going to do it great. I'm not going to say you're not going to make mistakes because if you're at two, you're kind of swinging punches everywhere, but it's still okay because you're starting to get your fight back and you're starting to move out of being a victim. You're starting to realize there are other possibilities. And just like I described you being at the bottom of that hole, you've now moved yourself up. You may be able to see there's an approaching storm. You may be able to see that there is help out there somewhere. You at least won't feel like you're at the bottom and you'll start to imagine that there are other possibilities. Hey, Jen. Yes. We do have another question in um, yes, level two. And the question is, what, what is a healthy rage? <laughs> I'm sure the, the police department has some feelings about that, but I think a health, uh, it's, you're not going to necessarily have healthy rage here. Um, but it's still healthy because you're not a victim. So at any point, I consider the rage healthy if you're starting to fight for yourself. So simple. And if you've been down in the dumps or you've been stuck at feeling like everything's happening to you, the minute you start to fight for yourself, it's, it becomes kind of contagious. Like it's, and that's why I call it burning down the house. You start to get some momentum because you realize, oh my God, this feels good. Like I have agency. I, I can fight for something. I, I'm worth fighting for. I deserve better than this, which is often, often where you get when you get to your, a really good burst level two is like, I deserve better than this. You may have no idea how you're going to get it yet. That's okay. You don't have to have all the answers right away. But just knowing you're worthy, worthy of doing better than this and that you deserve better, that's healthy rage. That's healthy. Don't go hurt anybody. I want you to use this as a catalyst kind of rage. This is a catalyst. Again, why I call it burning down the house? Because some people make mistakes. Some people go too far. Mostly, most often, you need a safe place to be crazy. You need a safe place to say your crazy thoughts. You need a safe place to take some of these things out to the ridiculous point that you never thought. Like you might talk about divorce and you had never thought of that before. You might decide that. Um, you hate your career, you chose it because it was the path of least resistance and you actually have a really strong creative side and why are you doing accounting? What are you thinking about? Like you don't know what it's gonna happen but the burning down the house part is when you start to act on it too soon. So my big warning is if you're feeling that momentum, pace yourself because none of us can, can manage change that fast. And if you're dealing with a family infrastructure or work infrastructure, anything where relationships already exist, if you start to change too fast, people are gonna freak out and you're gonna get negative feedback. And that's gonna feel familiar and it, may knock, it might knock you back down to one. So be aware that, like I said, butterfly effect, your energy affects everybody else. So if you come in raging and hot and you're going too fast, it's not gonna feel, you're not gonna get good feeling feedback. And that's why we want to eventually move you from this this catabolic energy in that is non-productive. That's what's important. It's non-productive into productive energy. And a really good place is that when you get to this level three and level three is, and, and I could go through all these levels, but I'm going to stop at level three because the, the rest are, I, I can do it a second um, presentation. But level three is really important because it's when you stop feeling like life is happening to you. And you don't need to go punch everybody in the throat. You're starting to cope, but not in a negative way. You're starting to cope in a way that feels productive. It is not going to, it's kind of the same energy that you normally would use for driving, for um, going grocery shopping. Like if you're, if you're taking care of yourself and you, and you're setting an intention, which is, I'm just going grocery shopping. I'm not curing cancer today. And the store is going to be it's going to be crowded because it's five and they never have enough lanes open. Like if you set your expectations, then you put yourself in this level three mentality, which is kind of like, I'm going to go along to get along. And it's actually a super good coping energy level that it's not, doesn't necessarily feed you. Think of it, you're straddling between catabolic and anabolic energy. So you're starting to move into productive energy. And depending on how you're doing, you can start to tap these others pretty easily. But what's really important is to know that getting into level three means you're going to be more available emotionally to now deal with some of the difficult issues. And honestly, I think, I think so many therapists would like to get their clients to about a level three 
because it means you've made the conscious decision to stop feeling like a victim. It's not all happening to you. And you've also made the conscious decision to not let the anger take over. You know you're angry. There's legit anger, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna run your life. So at, at a therapy level, level three starts to get to a place where you can go look at those things, but they're not gonna pull you back down, not gonna suck you in. And you can start to have discussions about probably what's really in your way are a lot of limiting beliefs. There's probably a lot of self-talk and mother talk and father talk and everybody else talk that's in your brain that's messing with you. When you're at level three, as you can see there, you're just coping. It's a, it shows you that, you're, that your energy is accessible and it starts to become productive. So you can start to change. You can let go of some of the garbage of the past or find a way to calm it down and by the way, like a bunch of us use brain spotting or EMDR. There's some really good effective techniques for trauma victims, but you cannot be in a place where you feel powerless or you're not going to be able to set the course for yourself. Remember, this is about you helping you. You may or may not have access to a therapist. You may or may not want to do that sort of thing, but what you want to do is be accessible to change and to be able to tell those limiting beliefs to be quiet. And you can't do them all at once. This is not, this is definitely slow. You can't do it all at once, but you can tell some of those limiting beliefs to be quiet and start to retrain yourself. So let me give you, so, so this is, as you get I, into- I have another question, Jen. Oh yeah, if sure thing. On. Okay, so, and, and this is actually my question. As I'm hearing um, you talk, which is like super relatable, um, I want to bring it back to triggers. And for yes. me, when I trigger- I go all the way down to one and it's hard to come out of that because I've been brought back to a place that I, I did feel that I can't do anything and that I am scared to death. And I, and I think that I can maybe get up even to a level three or four, but if I have a trigger, bam, I'm at the bottom and that journey is taking a little bit more time because it's, it's a scary fight. And so I guess what I'm asking you is, I don't think you're ever, and you already said this, you know, out of it, but I think triggers are a big part of that limiting belief and that self-talk that I can't do this and, and I'm unsafe and I'm not safe unless the doors are locked, all that kind of stuff. So, um, <laughs> okay, this is, a, this will just sound a little silly, but is there a quick way to deal with those triggers to ground yourself? You know what I mean? While you're having that trigger? Yeah. So. Okay, so I'm not going to say it's quick, but I'm, I'll tell not you if you go back to awareness. So the first, so the, here's the good things that what you just said, it's so important. Remember, your two things are awareness and intention. That's your mantra every day, awareness and intention, awareness and intention. How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? And what, how do I want to be? If the trigger were to happen and you realize you just caved, it just took you to that dark place. Oof, that happened to me so much in the last two years. I just would end up in a big bleh. The first thing is to be aware. So notice it. And those of us who write or draw or have other some other creative outlet, express it. So that's number one, awareness, right? So first be aware. And, and the fact that you recognize it as a trigger, that's already an advanced step. A lot of people don't even recognize the trigger. All of a sudden you realize you could cry and you don't know why, and you don't know what you just saw, heard, or felt, but now you just feel like a pile of poo, and you don't even know what the trigger was. So even if that happens, for me, when that happens, I have to stop, and I, I literally will stop and sit in a chair and go, wait, what happened? What just happened? What did I experience? And sometimes it'll be the silliest thing, like I saw an email heading or something on social media, and it just got me, and I didn't even realize it got me. First do awareness. So I would start writing a little bit or make a few notes on your phone or whatever it is that you can do to say, oof, I just fell into the, into the pit. If you can identify what got you there, that as you call it your trigger, Chris, because you knew, but if you can't, if you don't know it's a trigger yet, just see if you can identify what caused you to fall into the pit and then set an intention. And it can be the tiniest intention, which is, I love this one. I'm going to only be sad about this for 15 more minutes. I'm going to go full on sad about it. Don't even think that I'm not going to play this one to the hilt, but I only get 15 minutes. Just that intention gives you permission for the feelings, but it also tells your body and your brain, 
go hard, man. You got 15 minutes to live this out. And then we're going to start to move up. And then you could do a couple things. You could bounce right back up to three and say, I got to get back to coping and dealing with it. Now I know what this, what triggered me. And you still might not be able to define it, but you can go, God, I just got to watch these circumstances. Like maybe I don't get on social media if that was what you think might have done it. Maybe I don't get on social media just randomly during the day. It's like kind of a little bit of a landmine for me right now in my awareness of my own behavior. My intention is not to walk into nightmares. I'm going to avoid those right now. You'll know what are your hot spots, but as you start to keep track through awareness, you'll be you'll start to get more and more savvy about those things that'll send you. Like I have a rule, I do not look at email before bed. Absolutely positively no. Nothing can destroy my sleep faster than looking at email before bed. Even when I tell myself I'm not going to open them, I'm just going to look and see if there's anything important. No, there's nothing important. Sleep's important. That's my awareness and my intention. My awareness is that I know emails will get me at night and they're inevitable. It's like something awful. Um, or, and I want to sleep well. My intention is I want to get the best sleep possible. I don't want to be tripping on some stupid email that I see at night. So I usually stop. I'm usually done with email by about eight o'clock because I don't want to go down any rat holes. And I, emails can be so triggering for me. So that's an example of like awareness and then intention. So even if you go down, it's fine, but just decide maybe it's timing. Maybe, oh, I just qualified. I'm sad. Now I'm in level one. I just qualified for a walk. Like you can set it up so that that, even if you hit one, your intention is that qualifies you for a special treat. Maybe don't attach it to food, but a special treat. And so you can, however you want to cope, remember it's your path forward that works for you and supports your personal change. So think about what that how how those tools can help you always come back to awareness and attention because that's what you are right now and what you want to be those two things constantly adjusting all day long all the time it can, becomes easier with time but it's not a bad idea to be really intentional with it at first as you move into the productive areas of um, energy the anabolic energy that's on the slide and and as you go forward and it um, do something called an ELI assessment that does this formally to uh, evaluate how you use energy. And it also tends to reveal the, the traps you've set for yourself to end up at the energy levels you don't want to be in. Um, there's other ways you can, you can, you don't have to use the assessment. You can just constantly be checking in with yourself and say, hey, I feel like I can imagine anything's possible right now. Or, well, let me give you some examples of the tools. So you can see that if you want to shift energy, there's a couple tools you can use that are pretty simple, um, possibly worth taking note of, because if you can do these, I think I have three of them. If you can do these three things, these can have a dramatic impact on energy levels of not just you, but those around you. So I wanna make sure that you um, have, have access to those. The first is this, this this is my favorite one to shift energy. And I, I use this example a lot because it was so my childhood, but you, you're, and this is my, this was my childhood. My mom would cook dinner. We'd all sit down to dinner, formal, like not formal dining room, but formal dinner. We all sat down and had family dinner together. My dad would inevitably come in and he would be kind of grumpy because why did dads come to dinner grumpy? I don't know. Is that a thing? Anyway, it would be a little bit tense. And then one of the kids would jump up from the table. And if that happened, the wheels were off the wagon. Everybody started yelling at everybody. What are you doing? Sit down. We just, your mother worked hard to get this meal together. You need to sit in there and you need to like it. I don't care if you don't eat vegetables. Eat it. You know, that whole thing. Insert your drama here. My suggestion, and it's amazing, is instead of yelling at the kid who's bouncing up from the table and saying, sit down, because you don't know what they're doing. Who are you, God? Did you just decide you understand their intention? Do you have any idea what they're trying to do? I bet you don't. And here's the thing that happens most often, particularly with adults, but adults and children, wherever there's a power differential is where this happens, is the person with the more power has decided what the person with less power is going to do based on, I promise you, zero information other than the butt getting out of the chair. So instead of reacting to the butt getting out of the chair with anger, because you are not omnipotent just because you have more power, and this can also be employees at work, so don't get confused here, works with anybody, whether the power differential, ask, what is your idea? That simple, simple question 
will reveal to you delight. You could get a lame answer, like I'm going to go to the bathroom and then you can give them the shade like, really now? Did you not think of that ahead of time? But the thing is, if they've got to go to the bathroom, it's going to be a miserable dinner anyway. So let them go. Why would you want them to sit there with the need to pee? If your employee says, well, I, I was just doing what you told me to do. And it's like, no, what I meant was, what I was trying to give you lots of ideas. What is your idea? Like, well, my idea was that if, if we pursue this path and then they come up with some brilliant thing you never thought of, the minute you assume it's you're the person in power that you know what everybody else is going to do without asking them is the minute you're going to make mistakes. And it's also the minute you're going to piss people off and it makes the energy yucky. It drives the whole room down. So the simple question of what's your idea, I swear to God, you can use this anywhere, takes the beat. So you time it out. So everybody's not reacting too quickly. It eliminates misunderstandings and it opens up this universe of things that I promise you, you never thought of before. Because especially the more power you have, the more driven you tend to be and the less room you leave for new information. And what's your idea elicits new information. You'll start to understand the people you're collaborating with in a whole new way, including your children, including your partners, including whoever, once you ask, what's your idea? It's so much more delightful. And the person who gets the question of what's your idea, who's used to being yelled at, just shifts. Their energy shifts too. Takes you right out of that negative place. So now their idea could be lame. And you could say, well, that's an interesting idea. Right now, let's limit it to these two choices, which is you can sit here and eat dinner with us, or you can be excused and you won't have dinner tonight. There you go. That's, that's how that one. Like you can use your regular coping mechanisms. The point is to create that space instantly before reacting to an action that you're interpreting, but not validating because you don't know if that's what they're going to do. You're just interpreting it. You create space to further understand. And then you might get unexpected delight. It's happened to me so many times. It's worth it. It's, a, it's the number one parenting tool I used with my daughter is what's your idea? Because I never knew what her idea was. Oh my God, I still don't. So, but my God, she has great ideas. Never expected that. Like even kids, they have great ideas. So that's, that's the first tool you can use. The next tool is to decide in real time what matters most. So this is a picture of a mom driving a car with the kids in the car and the kids trying to take a selfie and it's raining outside. And you know, if you're a mom, if you're any kind of person who's been this, this person before, you know, you're just trying to drive. You're trying not to get provoked by all the noise in the car. You kind of want to play with them, but you kind of can't because you're responsible for keeping them alive. You get to decide this is so important. You get to decide what matters most in that moment. And yelling at everybody to be quiet and knocking down the joy of the kids in the car may not be the thing that you want to shut down. Maybe what you say is, you guys, it's really hard to drive right now in the rain. I'm going to take us all over to the yogurt place and we're just going to go get yogurts right now until the rain clears. Look, you just made a choice about what matters most. What mattered most is that the fact the kids were so excited and happy. They wanted to include you. I mean, you were their driver, but you were still part of the fun. And you just extended the fun instead of driving towards the thing you needed to do. Sure, they might be late to practice or whatever. All these rules. Again, all the noises in your head. But take a moment and be aware. This goes back to your awareness and your intention. Is your intention to further the delight and joy at the moment? Is the intention to get them there on time because there's going to be consequences? You have to decide. That's up to you. But you have the power to choose what matters most. And this is the one where I love this. Um, you get to traffic light and your car in front of you is like not turning. Or, and you got it. You, you are like irritated with them. And then you were to discover later because you know this has happened to you. The person in the car ahead of you was so discombobulated because they really had to go diarrhea. And I predict, I promise you, some of the worst drivers on the road right now are rushing to the bathroom. Well, if you were to think of yourself in that situation, you would be like, I just need the world, the universe to give me grace right now. I'm just coping with a little more than I can handle while I'm driving the car. If you can give that kind of grace, if you can think about what matters most in the world, it's not yelling at the idiot in front of you in traffic. It's just not. And that's never going to advance your cause or give you greater life satisfaction. It absolutely won't. It will always come back and make you unhappy. 
So the idea is decide consciously what matters most. And again, of course, I use the example of being with the kids. Sorry, talk a lot about the kids, but they can really knock you sideways when you're dealing with trauma because they are so needy. And all of us trauma people are so used to providing for everybody else because our needs don't matter, right? The last one is very high-minded. This would be when you tap high energy levels. And while I didn't go into them, I can tell you that, that the idea of as you move up the energy levels, the anabolic energy levels that give you that give you strength and give you life and give you new ideas and give you energy and power and life satisfaction is the idea of letting go of judgment. So I have a picture here of somebody at work, and this happens a lot at work. Often, we're so busy following all these rules that people have created that allow us to cope. I mean, we all couldn't drive on the streets if we didn't have rules we all followed. I get that. There's a, there's a rules have some purpose and they do help us. But if you're trying to innovate, if you're trying to change the current situation, your intention as an employee is, I don't want to work like this anymore. I want this to be more fun, more efficient, insert whatever word you'd like in there, then the idea is to shift the energy in a way to say what is truly possible. And that means letting go of judgment and letting go of limiting beliefs. I was on a team. We were, I couldn't hardly take it anymore. We were on our 55th brainstorm about what features we needed to add to the product. The problem was every time we had this meeting, we started with the darn list of all the things we couldn't do. And finally, I looked at this and I go, this is ridiculous. Like we're, this is Groundhog Day. What are we doing? We keep going back to doing the same thing. And I said, could we please have this meeting this time with what abouts? And there are no rules. Like what if that wasn't a limitation? What if we could do it the way we wanted? What would we really do? And I begged everybody in the room to let go of all those limiting beliefs and imagine what could be possible. And we came up with some very good ideas that we wouldn't have come up with before because once we let go of the rules, we still knew there were going to be things that were going to get in our way, right? We're not like idiots. We know there's some, going to be some pragmatic issues, but we let the ideas flow and suddenly we could see models from other businesses that we could adopt that went around what our limiting beliefs were. But because we had the limiting beliefs first, it stopped us from being innovative and it stopped us from being creative because we just thought there were all these constraints. So the minute you let go of the constraints, let's say you want to move across country. All you can think of is all the reasons why that can't work. All these constraints. Well, write them down, put them over there. You've got to just set them to the side because the fact is, is if that's something, if that's your intention, then you have to let go of the constraints and think of all the things that will actually work. What will support you? What could happen? What are the outcomes? What are outcomes you maybe didn't expect? Maybe there's a lot of cool ideas that you know. Maybe there's house exchange. Never even thought of that. Then. You don't have to buy a house. You're going to trade houses with somebody. I don't know, but it, the idea is let go of the limiting beliefs. All the you can't, you shouldn't, it won't, we aren't, it, it, it's too expensive. It's too this, it's too that. That's all the garbage that ties you down to low energy levels and makes you limit your choices on what you can manifest. So the last thing is to really imagine what is truly possible without all the reasons why it's not. You just have to stop with that for a while. This is a great one, again, with coworkers, with kids who are feeling frustrated or trapped, or that, especially if they feel powerless, especially if you feel powerless. Trauma victims often feel powerless. Let go of all the rules and all the shoulds and all the can'ts. Just let it go. Just purely play and fantasize and imagine because then you'll start to tap new ideas. And you'll also probably, I bet, you end up talking to different kinds of people that you wouldn't normally talk to who will also provide you with new and fascinating ways to solve your problem that you never would have considered before because you've moved out of the stuck place and into the what about place, into this amazing place of let's just pretend there are no rules. What's possible? You'll just shift the energy and then that positive energy, you know, like energy attracts, positive energy is going to attract other positive energy. So those are the, those are the big tools. I, I think this is my last slide. Yeah, those are the big tools. Um, the, I would go grab the graphic that, that is on Chris's group that shows the different energy levels and really think about how to push and pull yourself out of one, it's all, life happens to me, to no, I'm going to set an intention. Things aren't going to happen to me anymore. Today, I'm going to take care of myself and I'm going to figure out a strategy for not taking on everything and having it keep me down. 
again, it's not simple. This takes work, but it's so possible. And once and it and the best thing about it is once you start to do it, it begets doing more. It just starts to create this this cycle of positivity and change. And again, you'll have moments where you go down to low levels, but you'll be able to bounce out much faster. What you'll see is your recovery time starts to improve. And I think Chris, as a trauma survivor yourself, your recovery time now, it's vastly improved, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, like you still can have a weird moment or the blues or feel like, God damn it, I lost, I lost my 15th year. Like I lost, I don't even know what happened. Like that's still true. Yes. But I'm going to make up, like your intentions, like I'm going to make up for it and I'm going to be a silly ass woman on the weekend <laughs> and I'm going to be a goofball. Like you can just do that. And you set that intention and there you go. You know, okay, so what's ha- past is past. And I'm not saying ignore it. I'm just saying use it. As, uh, I love the, the women at Opus piece. It's like, don't waste your suffering. Don't. Start yeah. to turn this into stuff for you. And this is about you. It's about you and your power to use your energy to influence your family, your friends, your coworkers, everything, so that you start to take better care of yourself and you can start to move forward. So, you know, I would like to just kind of comment on, comment on that real quick because kind of what you've talked about today is you have relieved, at least for me, what I'm hearing, the feeling of doom. Okay. It might be doom for a minute. And yeah, I am angry that I lost all of my formative years, but I can be angry and still silly. Yes. I'm never going to not be angry at that son of a bitch, right? I mean, right. Like he, he deserves all that anger, but it doesn't have to change my life. And, um, and it doesn't have to control my life. And triggers, I had one last night. I thought I heard somebody coming into the house and, you know, waking up in the morning, like I was able to get through it and get back to another stage. So I think that the, the chart that you have there, I love it because it shows, um, that in and out and in and out, you're not stuck at a level. You might be there for, you know, five minutes and setting that intention, I think is just so super smart to give ourselves the permission. So we're not saying, Oh, this is bad. You're wrong. Oh my God. You've gone so backwards. No, no, just, deal with it and move on. Yeah. This is my, yeah. My 15, you might need an hour. Like this is my hour of my pity. I call it the pity party. I will tell my daughter, I'm going to have it a pity party. Leave me alone. I'm going to go like watch SVU in my room. Don't talk to me. Now, whatever that is, but that's just the intention is I need my time out. I'm not going to stay here. I can't afford to stay here. That's not going to help anybody, but I do deserve this. It's mine. I get to keep it. I get to have it. So it's, yeah, it's just, the, it's the balance and it's the idea of that you're starting to manage it instead of letting it manage you. Yeah. And once you turn the tables, it, you start to feel the power and it does have momentum. I don't know what else to explain it, but the momentum is there once you can turn the tables from, you know, even my suffering, I'm going to manage. Screw you. It's mine. I'm going to own it. Um, mine. I have another question. Yes, ma'am. Are you ready? Um, And it's probably the last one that we have time for, but why are people in lower levels more easily able to pull higher level people down? Is one level stronger than the other? Oh, so I, so I think it really has everything to do with the person, not so much the level, because there are people who suffer loudly and there are people who suffer in silence. And if you're, if, other people are pulling you down. I'm going to ask you first to check in on your own levels in that. Are you feeling too much that you need to help others? Because that's a good way to lose yourself. It's a really good way for a trauma victim to lose themselves is to focus on helping others and addressing everybody else's needs. That is probably the safest cage trauma victims live in. I'm not here. I'm here to help everybody else. I'm a good person. I'm here to help. So, so I would reverse it and say, why is it that when somebody's in a lower level mood, it has such a big effect on me? And ask, are you rushing in to save someone who needs to just feel their pain? And when you rush, and how do you feel when you're rushing in or when you're, um, when you're absorbing that energy, that, that catabolic energy from someone? So um, my dad walking mad to the dinner table I don't know why we all played that, that game. Like I I'm pretty mad at our family system that we all thought that that was okay. Instead of, you know what, dad, 
you need to come to the table like a decent human being. This is the time to catch up. I always called it news of the day. Like this is the most exciting time of the day to find out what everybody's doing. And you walk in like a big old ugly bear. No, but we didn't ever deal with it that way. Instead, we all adapted to his mood because again, the power differential is key. And so it's up to us. This is part of this whole awareness thing. Set the intention that we're not going to rescue people who are in a bad place. We're not going to, we're not going to buy and, and push our own stuff down. And that's really the thing I see with trauma people is they'll take any excuse to deal with anybody else's feelings, but their own. That is like the best, best, um, you know, snack food for trauma victims is to not have to deal with their own crap is to deal with somebody else's. So I would be really aware of your own feelings and what you're really tapping and why that's, why that you're letting them pull you down. What are the choices you're making? Thank you. I don't think we have any more questions in our chat. So I hope this is helpful. It's it's not hard. I promise you it's hard to do every time, but it's not hard in concept. It's just a practice, but it works. I promise it works. It's good. I think it's been good very stuff. liberating. I mean, like, yeah, there's tools, but like I, I had written a note, no doom. You're just not doomed ever. It's not, you're never you're not doomed. Always. Nobody's doomed. No. Nobody's doomed. So. I mean, we could probably find somebody who's truly doomed, but generally That's your ability to cope even through the hard times is you're about your own resilience and you're about your own ability to set the intention so even if you're going through something hard it's like but that's just right now it's something hard it's okay i'll survive i've survived before anybody listening to this who's a trauma survivor you guys have dealt with so much worse than almost anything i mean you're in terms of psychological resilience you have it you're here, you're present, you're listening. You care about making change. You've already demonstrated resilience. Just tap it, start to use it, make it your friend. Awesome. Okay, well, from uh, Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, I am here. Uh, we're gonna try to get back together November 4th where we are going to talk about internet safety on the social media platform. And Lori is gonna take us through that. So we'll send out an invite and this will be posted within the next couple of days. So thank you very much, Jen. Love you guys. Love you.